everyone Hi. Hi. okay <laughs> where to start uh, first thing just uh, make sure your mobiles are off or on a uh, flight mode uh, toilets are through there if you need them just watch the wire what we're gonna do we're gonna fit a lot in to like an hour just over an hour and you're really gonna have to just open up a little bit and put your belief system at the side because this sort of information I'm not the only one. There's a lot of us who've come to these realizations, a lot of smart people, and it takes about three months of solid research to get to even a wavering point. So what I'm going to try and do tonight is just cram in a lot. Because so I could do an hour on each little thing. I mean, there's about 200 subjects in this big subject. And you could do hours and hours. So I'm just going to give you an overview, a quick run through, and just take in as much as what you can, or not. Just see how it makes you feel. What I'd kindly ask is, if you've got any questions, which I'm sure you will have, I've still got questions, is just wait till the end. Because otherwise, you know, the, the question, I might answer your question later on as we go on. So what's been happening recently, the past few years, there's this sort of rise of true cosmology. People are start starting to question cosmology. And at the start, it sounds really crazy. It sounds like a bunch of crazy people. So we just need to cover some key aspects. And then as a group of people, as a species, we need to really think about some things. So the first slide. There are two ways to be fooled. One is to believe what isn't true. The other is to refuse to believe what is true. So this is something that... We all come across in our lives when we, oh, I realised that wasn't true. Oh, I realised that was true. This is something that happens to all of us as we go through life. Oh, that person wasn't very nice. I thought they were nice. So we're always going through these realisations. So I'm going to cover a lot. I'm going to go through a few different subjects. I'm going to look at the errors in mainstream cosmology, which everyone agrees on throughout the world. I'm going to look at the hand. Who's behind this mainstream cosmology? I'm going to look at what's going on at the moment, the alternate trend in cosmology. I don't have the answers, but I know what a lot of smart people are coming to, and we're all coming to the same sort of conclusions. Yeah, there are variants, but we're all talking about the same sort of thing. So there is alternate trend in cosmology. And on the internet, this is certainly trending. This is big, big stuff online. This is happening. I'm going to look at the sky luminaries, which is a very complex and maybe quite different to what we've been told. Again, I don't have the answers. Uh, why is this happening now? Why does it matter? A lot of people say it doesn't matter. I've still got to take the kids to school. I've still got to do the laundry. So we're going to look at why it matters. We're going to look at why, why would they lie about this? Why would they lie? Who, who's they? What's the benefit? We're going to look at cognitive dissonance. And we're going to look at, well, what next? You know, we've come here, we've listened to this stuff, but what's happening next? So, first off, I'm going to explain you're not here. We're told all our lives we are here. This is, this is CGI. No, no human spaceship has gone this far and turned around. There's no one in this room or on this planet that can tell me this is a real photo. It's not. That's a greed. You can speak to astrophysicists. It's not a photo. You know, millions of light years in their model. If you ask one of these astrophysicists what's at the edge of this universe, they don't know. What's at the edge of this expanding universe they believe in, they don't know. They don't know what's at the edge of this expanding universe. Isn't that a bit strange? 
I'm going to show you that you're not here. This sort of Milky Way galaxy. Again, that's, a, that's not a photo. You know, a lot of, we, grow up, we think that's a photo. It's not. It's, they, they will admit to you that's a computer image. No spaceship, if you believe in spaceships, can go that far. So, we're going to have a little look at this Earth, this spinning ball Earth. There's some strange images. Um, this is an image from 2012, official NASA. Official image, NASA, 2013. Size of America's changed a lot. You'd say, well, maybe it's closer or from a different angle, but then the ball size would change. So that, that's an error. That's an error. For me, the sea's never that blue. Th th that's not right. That doesn't work. I mean, maybe they made a mistake. Maybe I'm at fault and they made a mistake. But then there's these other images of this uh, spinning ball Earth we supposedly live on, and all, they all look really different. Which, you know, which one do you live on? Do you know which one you're on? And again, we see all these different colours, different filtering. And we all, we all just go, yeah, I live on this spinning ball. But these aren't real photos. There's more as well, different, different years, different size continents. Uh, it all look really different. And if they've been going up there since the late 1960s taking photos, it would all look kind of similar. You wouldn't have continents changing shape. And if you go to Google Images and type Earth from space, you're going to get pages and pages and pages of the same image. Until a year or two ago, when people like me, they started changing it and adding new images. But just three years ago, you'd have the same image for like four pages on, well, ten pages on Google Images. Just different contrast. But what they say is, they actually admit it, they say it's photoshopped, but it has to be. And Blue Marble's the famous picture of Earth that's in all the schools and all the encyclopedias. They actually admit, if you research, these are photo photoshopped composite images. They are computer images. It's not a conspiracy theory, it's a fact. They're computer images. You get these other images, uh, you know, Canada's looking a bit underwater, they sort of, they had to go to lunch, they're on Photoshop, they just did it a bit quickly. So, the, the official spinning ball model has curvature, that's pretty obvious. And this is the official astrophysics, university, Harvard model of the curvature. So if you walk in a straight line, flat, on the ball model, 10 miles, there is 66 feet of curvature. So you walk flat and there's 66 feet of curvature in 10 miles. That's quite a lot of curvature. If you go 100 miles flat, there should be on the ball 1.2 miles of curvature. It doesn't exist. It just doesn't exist. It's not there. And I know how crazy it sounds. People have beamed lasers 27 miles, no curvature. People have seen lighthouses from, well, some lighthouses you can see from 70, 80 miles away. But if you do the maths on the one at southern England, it's only a small one, 180 feet. It should be 99, 900 feet below the curvature. You shouldn't be able to see it. But boats can see it. I took this photo from Marbella, quite near where I live. And I could see these, these African mountains due south. I had a compass. And I went back home and I saw these mountains in Africa were just 200 metres high. So I did some mathematics. OK, it's 86 miles away. I did some maths. And these mountains in Africa should have been like two kilometres below the curvature. The curvature is just not there. Now, I don't mind if we live on a ball. I don't, I don't mind. But it's got to act like a ball. Um, you have things like periscopes on submarines. Now, if the, ball, if the planet was a ball, the periscope would only see about two or three kilometres. It's not much use. Especially when they say torpedoes can go about ten kilometres. So they're like looking with the periscope fire. It doesn't add up. Because the periscope can only see two kilometres, but the torpedo can go ten kilometres. And on top of that, they say the torpedo can curve in water. This is not, this is not the case. It's not the case. It's not true. Torpedoes don't curve in water. That's, that's, that's crazy talk. There's a lake in LA, 23 miles long. No engineer on the project put any curvature into the cement or the road. 380 feet of missing curvature. 
I could do these for an hour. I could do these all night. I could show you hundreds of them. Another one, hardcore maths has been done, 86 miles away. Should be a thousand feet of curvature. Should be below, shouldn't be able to see it. It should go beyond the ball, the curve of the ball. And then we've got some uh, photos from planes and helicopters. That's Dubai, which I would call a satellite station, but we'll come along to that later. Can't see any curvature. Tokyo, again, looks no real curvature. And what the mind does, it says, well, well, the Earth's really big. And I'll tell you, yeah, the curvature's really big as well. It's like between the North Pole and the equator, you've got to get through like 3,000 kilometers of curvature. It's not there. It's just not there, bro. There you go. No curvature. There's some people, some people in school, some people into this alternate cosmology. They've sent amateur balloons up 100,000 feet. No, no curvature up there either. It's not there. There we go. It's another balloon that's gone up. A bit of a hot spot from the sun. Uh, we'll come on to that a bit later. The sun looks quite close there. Again, another balloon. And don't take my word for it. Go, go home and search balloon in space and have a look. I'm just one guy. Certainly don't take my word for things. There we go, drawing a little line on there. You know, that's a lot of distance we can see. And this is interesting as well, is no matter how high you go, if you go up a mountain in the Alps or you're on an aeroplane, the horizon always goes to eye level. It always rises to eye level. And again, the mind goes, well, it's a big ball. But no, with the maths that they tell us, with the size of the Earth, you should see the horizon drop. Like, think of a flea on a basketball jump you know, three millimetres, the basketball horizon would go down a bit, you know. So even at 100,000 feet, the horizon's rising to eye level. That isn't right. I'm not an expert scientist, but that, that's not right. You don't have to be super intelligent to know that's not right. The horizon shouldn't rise to eye level. And what they do in their line, they're frigging things. So Google Earth which is mainly cartoons. They tell you it's from satellites. <coughs> They've just done planes and modeling from high altitude planes. They own a fleet of planes, Google, and they put curvature into their cartoon model. You know, you can see their amateur rocket, 37 miles in Google Earth. Again, NASA photo. If that NASA photo was real, that glider would be about 1,000 miles wide. It doesn't work. So we catch them out and they're using Photoshop and they're using a GoPro lens to warp things. Now, this is a, we're just showing up what they do. This is Lake Tahu, 22 miles of level water. And NASA say, NASA gave us that picture. But in, in normal life, we see that picture, we don't mind. It's like, oh yeah, there's the earth. And we go on and do the wash the dishes. We don't give it the attention we really should. This is uh, Italy. Now, for me, it's, if Italy was that big, I could go there for lunch. I'd go there for dinner <laughs> and walk there in 10 minutes. I'd, go for a pizza, I'd bring pizza back. Bring you all some pizza. And this yellow thing they put on, I don't know what, I don't even know what that is. This yellow thing, I don't know. So what's quite interesting to do, when you see a picture with this sort of curvature of the Earth, you just keep following it, and then you see that they're lying. Because the Concorde plane... You know, it's not 3,000 miles long. <laughs> I phoned up, uh, when I was researching this at the start a few years ago, I phoned up this uh, flight instructor, and I said, do you dip the nose down on your aeroplane? Because obviously, with the earth curving, the plane should dip the nose down every few miles. And she got really angry with me. It's online somewhere. And she said, no, no planes, I've been teaching flying for years, no planes dip the nose down. And I said, well, you, that's, what? And then she got really angry, and I don't want to go into it, I was really hurt. <laughs> Thought we could be friends. And also the, gyros, the, the, gyro, the gyroscope on planes is not an electronic device. The gyroscope hovers. The gyroscope is just a hovering thing. And it always shows the horizon level. It doesn't go down, then you have to, it doesn't go up, then dip the nose down, go up, dip the nose down. The, gy the gyroscope is just like this. So I know quite a lot of pilots who are into this true cosmology. I know a pilot who's been banned from his, 
commercial license because he's interested in this information and this is only going to get bigger. So what, these, what she's saying, this flight instructor, she says planes don't dip the nose down and it just magically stays at the same altitude. What, if that were true, if the plane didn't dip the nose down and we lived on a spinning ball, the plane would find itself at 80,000 feet in just half an hour and it would soon be in this mythical outer space in a vacuum. Gravity also. Yeah, we're going to come to that, sir. It's last, last chance, speaking out. <laughs> okay, we've got uh, the SR-71 Blackbird. I think it's taken out of commission now. Uh, had a top speed of 2,193 miles an hour. That's 500 miles of curvature each hour. So it's getting through 500 miles altitude of curvature each hour. That's 700 feet of curvature a minute. So this guy should be really hitting, putting the nose down all the time and going at that sort of speed. That, that's, that's just nonsense. That doesn't add up. It doesn't add up. This is, this is facts. This isn't, I'm, not, I'm not making things up here. I'm just telling you something that's real. It doesn't add up. Uh, they've got radar systems now that go 300 miles. Uh, so what they're saying is that the radar goes round a ball. That, uh, that, don't, that don't really work. If you look into radar technology, it doesn't really go round a ball. It doesn't really work. So I suggest if, you, if you're on this ball and you're starting to wobble, have a little look at these radar systems and try and tell me, if you can email me, how these radar systems go round a ball for 300 miles because they just don't work like that. The rail gun uh, goes 100 miles uh, in a perfectly straight line. That's 6,000 feet of missing curvature. That's uh, a photo of some windmills. The wind farm's in the sea, 20 kilometers away. I think it was 19.8, a uh, friend told me. Shouldn't be able to see them, should be below the curvature. But what, and I said it myself, you think, oh, but I've seen boats go beyond the curvature. You know, you're down the beach in Spain, you're having your ice cream, you can't see the boat anymore, you think it's gone behind, below the curvature. But with these new P900 cameras, with this new zoom, you can bring the boat back. This is with a P900 camera. And there's a movie of this online, you just bring the boat back with a zoom lens. It just reappears. What it is, the boat's gone past the humanized vanishing point. And it can go beyond the camera lens's vanishing point. But we'll come on to that. So when you're looking into these, this sort of horizon, this line of convergence, you need to learn new things like the eye's vanishing point, how the eye works, what is angular resolution, what's an inferior mirage, what's a superior mirage. Because there's a lot of people who cling on to this, but the boat goes below the curvature. It's all been debunked. Unfortunately, I can't spend an hour on it tonight because I want to cover loads more stuff. And if we can see boats going over the curve of the horizon, then these boats, are, you know, they're floating. These people who say the boat goes below the curvature, they don't even really know what's going on with the eye or the sea or the atmosphere. They just say it. They don't even really know why. We're going to that later on because I've always been wondering about how it really works with the eye. You know, where does it stop and why does it work this way? We will have a slide on the line of convergence a bit later, yeah. Okay, right. This is quite an interesting one for you. So if the sun was setting over a ball, over a curve, it would act like the top one. That's scientific method, repeatable, scalable, we've tested it. But what we actually see is like the bottom one, the middle one. So the top one is how, what we'd expect to see, but we actually see what happens in the middle one, where it's level. And here we see level again, that's what we experience. So we experience like this, the sun acts like a level, like it's acting on a level piece of water. Nothing seems to be bending anywhere, nothing seems to be curving anywhere. So I want to talk about motions of the Earth. There are four motions, supposedly. One is the Earth spins a thousand miles an hour on itself. One is it spins around the sun, 66,000 miles an hour. One is that the sun, or the whole solar system, mo moves through the galaxy, 483,000 miles an hour. And the whole Milky Way galaxy is moving through the universe at 1.3 million miles an hour. That's four crazy motions <coughs> in a crazy spin. 
but we can see the same stars every night for measurably thousands of years. That don't make sense. I would expect some parallax. I would expect a little bit of parallax where some stars nearer us would move at a different rate to some stars further away. And this slide's not great quality, but it's just to show you that they say this star's 700 light years away, this one's 200 light years away, but they all move in perfect unison for thousands of years. I would expect, I mean it's a bit of an exaggeration, I'd expect something like this if I was travelling through the universe that fast, some stars whizzing by, like on, you know, Star Trek, where all the stars are whizzing by, I'd expect, you know, one a month whiz by, it's kind of normal with those sort of motions. It's another interesting one, you probably have to get your head around it in your own time, that summer solstice, you're facing away from the sun at night time, you see stars in the sky. 180 million miles later, December, winter solstice, face the sun daytime, face nighttime, face the stars. You're looking at an opposite direction, 180 million miles away, you can see some of the same stars in the sky. That ain't right. That ain't right. That's not right. I don't care what qualifications you got, I don't care who you are, that ain't right. You can't reconcile that with that. Polaris, North Star, every night spins in a circle. It's again another exaggeration, this slide, but I'm just trying to show you. With those motions, I'd expect something a bit more crazy in the sky. And the, the mind goes, oh, but those astronomers have worked it out. They've, uh, you just haven't gone to school. And that's what the mind does, and the mind did it itself. But let's cover a bit more. What NASA do in the education system, they try and get away with this by saying, Polaris is 2,604 trillion miles away. And your eye can see it. <laughs> yeah. But, and they say it's 44 million miles wide. But what, and I looked into this, I've, I've look, I was looking into this full time every day, years ago. I still do look into it a lot. There is no instrument or evidence that these stars are this far away or this size. There's no instrument, it's not measurable, there's no proof, there's, there's nothing there, it's all... It's pretty crazy. Another thing, I spoke to someone earlier about this, they were sort of laughing, oh you that guy, ha <laughs> ha. And I said, have you ever seen a shooting star? We've all seen shooting stars in the sky, da 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 da. No human has ever seen a shooting star come up from below the horizon. On a spinning ball, you should. And the person went, uh, refraction, gravity, relativity, just the buzzwords. <laughs> just didn't even know what they were saying, really. And this is a good one. When we talk about these motions of the Earth, if you fire a soccer ball out of a truck going at 50 miles an hour, you fire it out of 50 miles an hour from a truck going at 50 miles an hour, the ball just stands still. Boom. That pretty much tells me there's no other motions. And the motions they tell us we have this, you know, these four crazy wild motions, there's not one instrument that can measure them. That's fact. That's fact. You can go up to Harvard and say, knock on the door and say, show me evidence of the Earth spinning, of Earth spinning around the sun. There's no evidence. There's not one instrument that proves it. So when you go further north on this spinning ball, your weight doesn't change. You don't find it harder to move. And of course, you just say, oh, it's all relative. Uh, okay, the next two slides I'll lead on from them, but um, is this really possible if the Earth's spinning at a thousand miles an hour, these smoke flumes from volcanoes? You would, you would logically expect the smoke to be at an angle because the Earth's spinning. If a helicopter took, up and took off and hovered and the Earth spun, it landed from hovering, you'd expect it to be at a different place, but it isn't. Because what mainstream science says is the whole atmosphere is spinning as well. So they say the Earth is spinning at 1,000 miles an hour, and they say the, the atmosphere is spinning as well. So that means the higher altitude the atmosphere is spinning faster. Do you understand? So nearer this vacuum, they say that the air molecules are travelling faster than the air molecules nearer the Earth. That's how they get away with this helicopter thing. 
This is a wild accusation, wild theory they have, and it is a theory. But then, then I jump into this, when I see this image, I'm like, how can you have a spinning vacuum, spinning atmosphere with oxygen and all the rest, next to a vacuum with no border? The vacuum would just suck it out. That's how vacuums work. I went to see some scientists two, it was about three years ago, and I said, I want to know how high this line is between the non-vacuum and the vacuum. No one knows where it is. They say, oh, it's around 100 kilometers. I'm like, can you show me something tangible, like scientific method? They've got nothing. I said to them, how does, it, how does a spinning atmosphere become just a vacuum? They said it just gets less oxygen, less oxygen, less oxygen, <coughs> stops spinning, and then there's a vacuum of space. I laughed at the guy, he got really angry, he was going to beat me up and <laughs> I just I don't want to fight today, I'm just going to get out of here. Millions and millions of curse words. <laughs> so th what they say is, this mythical gravity, which we'll get onto, it knows where the atmosphere ends and the vacuum begins and gravity holds a particle of oxygen at the edge of space. Now, if gravity were real the way they say it, it would surely pull the oxygen molecules to the Earth. But we'll come on to that. Just have a little think in your own time about this, this at spinning atmosphere next to a vacuum. Because you start thinking about it and it's not right. And then you go and speak to scientists and they don't know. Then we've got a problem. This is another play on this. The atmosphere is a positive pressure system. The vacuum of space is a negative pressure system. Science is saying no barrier necessary, but a submarine, they want a barrier between the two pressure systems. Everywhere else we see we need a barrier between two pressure systems. Like in an aeroplane, you don't open the window in an aeroplane because it's a pressure system. But all of a sudden, at the edge of our atmosphere, they tell us, oh, we're, we're, really, we're really clever and you're not. Uh, they call this the centre of the galaxy. They've got no, nothing to back that up. They just, just what they call it. The Milky Way is a very new term. I call this the dark rift because a lot of ancient myths call this the dark rift. I've made a documentary about these myths. I'm not saying these myths are true or not. I just collaborated all these ancient myths about this thing in the sky that the ancients called the dark rift. If you're interested in it, have a look. Uh, We've got to move on, but sundials don't work on a globe, nor do compasses. The thought, compasses have to be held flat to work. If you're in Australia, okay, you think you're on this sort of five o'clock on a, on a curved ball, what, you hold this compass like at that angle, and then it goes round the ball, it just doesn't work. So gravity, we got there. This one's for you. You're going to love this one. So what they say is with gravity uh, that it can hold, it's so strong, it can hold millions of tonnes of water to the underneath of a spinning ball. Even cargo ships, they're, they're holding on real tight. But you can, you can blow a dandelion and it just floats off. That's it. So we should all just go home. That's it. Let's, let's go home. That's it. We're done. It's game, set and match. And this scientist said to me, Oh, but the dandelion's got less mass. I said, your baby's got less mass, but it's not floating around the room. Because <laughs> these science, it's madness. So what, what they say is, if, if this ball's massive, it will have the exact opposite effect. So when you spin a ball, the water falls off. And they say, oh, but at school we spun a bucket round. No, that's, that's a bucket. That's different. This is a ball. So they just tell you if it's bigger, they say, oh, but this isn't in space, this isn't in space. So you just need to see in your own mind where you sit with this, because where we sit with it is generally what we were taught in school when we were at a very young age and our brains were very open. That's where a lot of this knowledge was pumped into us. And when we go back and look at it in a serious way, things don't add up. Uh, some of these clouds are very heavy. They're like, this one's 1.1 million pounds, a cumulus cloud. So they've, you know, what is it? They turn the gravity off for the cloud and turn it on for the water. <laughs> well, it doesn't. Anti-gravity machine. And you, your brain thinks, oh, but the science knows an answer for that. But it doesn't. 
I've been there all night, staying up, looking for the... There's nothing there. There's another one. If gravity... They say, oh, Jupiter's a big ball of gas. Gravity pulled it together. Well, this lot, this is a cloud they say is in space. Why, why hasn't gravity formed this into a sphere? Doesn't, doesn't make sense. So gravity, strong enough to hold the oceans to a spinning ball, weak enough that the birds can still fly. So the moon, strong enough to overcome the earth and sun's gravitational pull and move mass amounts of ocean water, and yet too weak to pull a small amount of water in a glass. I won't come on to this now, a bit later, but moons have a think why, if you believe the moon alone creates tides, why it doesn't affect large lakes and why it only affects oceans. There's a reason. But what they did, because people like me and there were others were all online putting this stuff out, they did this like three months ago. They said, oh, we found gravitational waves. And all they had was this picture of a pig's nose. And that's all they had. They said, we found gravitational waves. Because they've never found the graviton. It's a mental theory. It's a mental theory. If you go to Harvard and you say, show me gravity, they say, well, we don't really know. It's a, it's a theory. It's officially a mental theory. It's in your head. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, I mean, you believe that. You actually believe your nan's on a cruise. It's, but no one's ever seen that. It's never been measured. It's not repeatable. It's not provable. It's never been proven. I could go into this for a long time, but gravity is a mental theory of assumptions. It believes that things form a sphere. It believes it creates black holes. It believes it bends light over trillions of miles. All of these things are pseudoscience. They're not repeatable. They're not provable. There's no evidence. I know what you think. You think there is evidence. There has to be. You've missed something. But I promise you, I've spent more time looking at this than probably everyone in the room. So, wow, 30 minutes, okay. This is how light would reach us uh, from 93 million miles away from a giant sun, that's fact. But then we witness this. And what they say is this is crepuscular rays. And they say it's due to refraction. I mean, yeah, I believe in refraction. Light and water do bend light, but not, not to that amount. That's like wild. That's like, oh yeah, refraction exists, but that's, that's a massive leap from believing in refraction to believing the sun is 93 million miles away. A uh, quick look at the moon in these ball earth errors. If you light up a sphere, you get a hot spot. <coughs> the moon doesn't have that. Here's a rock being lit. You get like a different shades, and here's the moon lit. We'll come on to this a bit later, but it's very highly probable that the moon illuminates itself. And I know how crazy that sounds off the bat. Here's the, for people that believe the sun, the moon's lit by sunlight. I mean, you can see this a few days of the month before the new moon, after the new moon. That's not right. This is a good one. We spoke about this earlier. If the moon is reflecting sunlight, why is direct moonlight always colder than the nearby moonshade? It acts very differently to sunlight. Plants act differently. Uh, combustion acts differently. Temperatures act differently. The colour's different. To believe the moon is reflecting sunlight, I'm happy for any... I'll give any of you a thousand bucks if you can show me evidence that the moon is reflecting sunlight and I'm on camera, it's going online. I'll give any of you a thousand bucks. You don't even have to give me anything in return. So when they went to the moon, I mean, if you believe that, you've, you've just turned into the wrong... You probably thought... I'm going to go to yoga and you've come in the wrong room. If you believe in the moon landings, you're just probably in the wrong place. I mean, it's never been this bright when you're, when you're on the moon. Uh, if, if the bull model was real and the moon model was all real, if you were in Europe or Australia, you would, you would see slightly different face of the moon, maybe an extra 20%, 30%. But every human in this reality sees the same face of the moon. No extra, no less. Every human, doesn't matter where you are, so that itself rules out this globe. Uh, you can see detailed areas on the moon. From two, they say it's 238,000 miles away. The human eye is just not that good. 
I apologise for having to go quickly through these slides, but there's a lot of stuff I really want to cover. Uh, water always finds its level. That's repeatable scientific method. Scalable, observable. All rivers go into the sea. Seas don't go into the rivers. And this is a bit of a mind play. Think about this tomorrow or something. Why, don't, why doesn't the sea go into the rivers? On a ball, on a spinning ball, should be about 50% of the time, the sea goes into the river. Estuaries, that's where the sea goes into. There are a few exceptions, like estuaries, yeah. But generally, on a spinning ball, you would have about 50%. It would be around half and half, not one in a hundred. So what you've got is this observable, repeatable, measurable scientific method. Water always finds its level. And this sort of pseudoscience, I'll call it pseudoscience because it's not provable, this sort of bendy water. So what, you know, what all humans are programmed or believe to think is the top one. But I'm much more with the, the bottom one. It seems to make a lot more sense from what my direct experience in this reality is. Because what you believe, if you believe the top one, you believe you're on, I think it's Florida, you're standing on the beach in Florida, and to get to Hawaii, there's six miles rise of water, and then it goes down six miles. So you're believing that there's this big hump of water in front of you. That's kind of crazy. For me, I mean, you can believe what you want, but for me, that's a little bit wild. So they say there's all these satellites in space, thousands of them, all in orbit. <coughs> And, you know, you're with your friends, oh, look, there's a satellite. But I can tell you, you can't see something the size of a car 400, 300, 500 miles away. You can't, your eye can't do that. You, you, it's not possible. So what you're looking at, I would say, are high-altitude drones, high-altitude craft, high-altitude planes. High-altitude drones, they've had drone technology for decades. Um, satellites, this is in England. Satellites are all pointing, they're not pointing up, they're pointing to Luxembourg where there's a giant antenna. And what you found in like the 1920s when they started building skyscrapers, they put antennas on the top of all these skyscrapers. They're, that's what's going on, it's triangulation. Your cell phone works on triangulation to the three nearest masts. There's a lot of these antennas in the ocean. Why would they be there if satellites existed? It's a lot of these tetra masts. And if you study how the internet works, you want to watch some football on TV, you know. It's underwater fibre. There are millions of miles of underwater fibre. This is technically and officially known as how the internet works. Why would they put millions of cables in the ocean if there were all these thousands of satellites? I actually made a series online called the Essa Hoax series. Uh, I looked into satellites and how they're a hoax. I phoned up Essa. I phoned up all their offices in Europe. All I got was, I said, I want to speak to someone who knows about a particular satellite, because I knew it was a hoax. And they said, there's no one here, just media department. Phoned up the next office in Germany. No, it's just media. Phoned up the next office in Italy. Uh, do you want to speak to the PR department? There's no one there. It's smoke and mirrors. And you can watch my ESSA hoax series. It just shows a lot of the ESSA space uh, footage. I'll get onto that. If you study online or in books how cell phones work, there's nothing to do with satellites. It's all triangulation. So I got a bit confused a few years ago about how a satellite gets into orbit. I would have thought that the satellite would fly off into space or gravity would suck it to the Earth. What keeps it at this, this finite point? No one knows. The, the scientists don't know. They say... But, but, can you wait to the end, please? So we'll just have a free-for-all. I totally respect your opinions. But a force of propulsion obviously gets you out of this mythical, mythical border of the atmosphere, but then you just float off into space in the vacuum. Or, if you got your angle wrong, gravity would pull it down. So what gets them at this exact correct angle? And no one knows. 